Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining and welcome you uh, to Trezor Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Uh, and we start, we start this month with the first Twitter space among three, uh, which will be about modern encryption and Bitcoin. And I would like to welcome our guest, Adam Back here, CEO of Blockstream, and I think a person who doesn't need any introduction. Hi, Adam. Hello. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining. And Pavel Rusnak, uh, co-founder of Satoshi Labs, uh, CEO of Trezor, or ex-CEO of Trezor. Hi, Pavel. Hello, everyone. I think we can start without a further ado and hop straight on the first question, which actually suggests itself. Uh, what is encryption and why do we need it? With one condition. Can you try explaining it as you would to a 15 years old and cover the main milestones in its development if possible? Adam, would you like to start? Yes, um, so I guess the, um, the point of encryption is to be able to preserve privacy and stop data theft. And in Bitcoin, all of the, uh, the coins you're in, your, in your wallet are controlled by keys. And so in many wallets, the keys are encrypted in some ways. Uh, they're backed up, of course, but then they're also encrypted uh, before you access it. And so I think in a general sense, um, encryption is used by, you know, laptops to encrypt files on the drive or for accessing secure websites where you're making payments. Most websites today have uh, communications encryption, SSL. It's about Two, two forms of encryption, either protecting data on storage devices, so that if somebody finds or steals or seizes, or you lose a storage device, they can't access it if they don't know the passwords. And for communication encryption, because the data is flowing over a public network, then you need a different form of encryption. And that is to prevent people who can access the data, like your ISP, or other people out on the internet where the packet throws, flows through their equipment that they can't read and eavesdrop on you know, what you're buying on a website or what you're talking about with a friend, whether that's chat or uh, you know, a voice call and so on. So not everything is encrypted, but a lot of things these days are encrypted. And it's pretty important for Bitcoin because Bitcoin is highly valuable and you know, hackers and different uh, people would like to copy or steal your Bitcoin keys. Yeah, uh, let me add uh, something to it. I I, I thought that uh, Adam would mention some uh, specific uh, real use cases how encryption is being used uh, today, and I thought that uh, in order not to not to say the same thing uh, i thought that i can maybe tell you a little something about the history of encryption because this is the first uh, the first uh, uh, of free uh, twitter spaces about uh, awareness about uh, cryptography so i think uh, a little bit of history is make make sense now so as uh, adam said uh, encryption is the process of converting uh, original information that can be read uh, by anyone and this piece of information is called plain text uh, into different information that can be read only by authorized people and this is called the ciphertext and uh, to achieve this we usually use a little bit of extra information that is uh, called encryption or the decryption key and uh, this is then shared with the other parties and now i will get to to history uh one of the first uh, well-known examples of such schemes is probably heard about that is uh, caesar's cipher uh, which used a system in which in where each letter was shifted up or down uh, a fixed number of position in the alphabet 
and the key in the scheme, this extra information uh, that is being used as a key in this uh, setup uh, was the number of position shifted. And since, since the number of possible keys in this scheme is uh, not that great, it's the same as the size of the alphabet, which is 26 for English alphabet. This is not, of course, a secure scheme because an attacker can easily try all possible keys. So that's why this scheme is not used today, but uh, several uh, thousands years ago, it might have been a good uh, option. And today we use much more modern schemes uh, where the keys, the, the number of possible keys uh, is so big, it's impossible to try them all one by one. And we call this uh, a brute forcing a key. And such modern schemes that we use, uh, like Adam said, uh, in HTTPS and for encrypting data stored on your disk, is uh, usually AES or ChaCha20. And also, I, I will talk a little bit about uh, another problem with the Caesar cipher scheme, and that's uh, you might be able to decrypt the, the cipher text without even brute forcing all possible keys. And you can buy, do this, for example, by counting the num the occurrences of each uh, letter in the sentence. Uh, this is called a frequency analysis. And uh, since you know that in English the most common letter is E, and in your ciphertext uh, you see the most common letter is C, for example, you know that you have to shift all numbers, uh, sorry, all letters by two without even knowing that uh, the key was two or without even trying all of these possible options. So this is uh, another attribute of modern encryption. You want the encrypted data to look as much random as possible. They should look like a total random noise. So you can't perform this kind of analysis on it. And that's uh, what we luckily have. And uh, this is what protects us right now. Yeah, I think something else that might be, um, I guess, unintuitive to people who are not familiar with the technology is that most systems give a specification and describe how the encryption works. You know, you get the source code, the encryption algorithm. The only thing you don't know is the key. And yeah, it's secure. So, you know, some of the very early schemes were just kind of spycraft, right? They would hide something. And if you knew where it was, you could find it or you, you, you know, so really just the hiding of the existence of the message was more important. But the modern schemes are uh, designed so that they are secure, even if somebody knows the algorithm and everything about it and has the source code. And there's a, uh, there's a, there's a thing called uh, Kirchhoff's principle. So he was a mathematical cryptographer who, who made this observation or, or design observation that cryptography algorithms should be secure to disclose and all of the security should rest in the key. And of course, the modern cryptography schemes have such large keys that it's very impractical for uh, them to be broken by brute force. So, you know, Pavel mentioned brute force on some of these old schemes, but the new schemes have, you know, 128 bit key strength or, or bigger. And to, to attack something like that is impractical. You know, I mean, Bitcoin has uh, a lot of compute power behind it on different works with proof of work, but it's nothing compared to this, right? So, you know, all of Bitcoin's work to date would not be enough to decrypt one message. And of course, it, you'd have to start again for each new key. So it's really a quite remarkable piece of technology that's been developed and in use for some decades. That means that we can have uh, such high confidence and such asymmetry between the cost to the attacker, which is you know, virtually impossible, and the uh, security for the user. Now, of course, uh, users are sometimes the weak point 
if, if there's a password involved or they write their password down in a bad place or they choose a bad password, that kind of thing. So that's another topic. But the basic encryption schemes are extremely secure. And that's a really great point that you have there, Adam, that we are now able to construct algorithms that are completely out there in the open and they are auditable. Everybody can look into how they work. And the only secret information is that uh, key that is being passed. And that uh, basically allows us to construct such beautiful things as Bitcoin, where everybody is welcome to work on it and uh, look into it, make it make it better, and basically fill fill in this uh, this motto or this mantra: "Don't trust, verify." That's something really amazing. Thank you, Adam and Pavel, for the for the thorough explanation of the inscription and the historical backgrounds of it. Uh, before proceeding to the next question, I would like to mention that I encourage our listeners to ask questions, but I would like to ask you to reserve them for the second part because because we have a lot to discuss, and we will have the specific section, uh, or specific parts when we will open up the the talk, and you will be able to. Uh, add your inputs or comments or ask questions, discuss with, with Adam and Pavel. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I will just try to connect uh, straight away the theory and the practical implementation of it with the following question. Uh, why is cryptography and cybersecurity a topic that general public should care about nowadays? Does this change with uh, increased use of Bitcoin or it's um, unrelated? Well, yeah, I mean, I, th I think um, historically cybersecurity has been a bit of an arms race and people, you know, while the technology might exist, if people were extremely diligent who operate, you know, services, run, you know, websites, um, online services, would spend a lot of effort reviewing and designing it right. In practice, everything has a cost. And so historically, online security has not been very great. And so there have been, you know, you have to look at the news to see databases of leaked information that was hacked or accidentally exposed on the internet to see that it's quite hard. You know, it takes effort and it's quite hard to secure against unauthorized disclosure. But I think, um, you know, Bitcoin finally gives people a reason to really focus and care about security, which is now you have bearer cash and the consequences of a leak is not, you know, a loss of privacy or an identity theft issue to clean up, but you lose all your money. And so, you know, finally we have a reason to actually care about and do security correctly. And so I think Bitcoin really is in a way at the forefront of, uh, you know, internet security, secure key management and processes and hardware and software around that. So I think ultimately, you know, maybe Bitcoin can solve some other problems. And you, you see that already today with um, security related applets being installed on hardware wallets that are not directly related to Bitcoin. You know, things like two factor devices, two factor authentication uh, protocols for logging into websites unrelated to Bitcoin. Um, just because Bitcoin has had to solve the sort of secure base problem, we need a, a starting point to provide security from. And so, Bitcoin solution of hardware wallets. Is actually beneficial and useful to general, you know, online secure services and things. Pablo, would you also add, would you like to add something? I, I think that uh, Adam covered it just just perfectly. Uh, I wanted to contemplate a little bit about the cypherpunk movement. Uh, because that's that's the movement that started around uh, late uh, 1980s and uh, developed much in the 1990s and uh, uh, it was uh, a movement that uh, advocated and still is uh, advocating the widespread use of uh, cryptography in order to induce uh, social change and uh, a lot of a lot of people are being cypherpunk and privacy aware since since forever basically and uh, for most uh, other people that are not living cypherpunk life it was very hard to 
understand why to live a life like that where you are using privacy enhancing technologies uh, why, why to live like that if you have nothing to hide and how does the existence of encrypted email for example changes the world for the better but i think with bitcoin we finally have uh, like a really really good application that is showing everybody all around the world that this uh, this movement uh, has and uh, has uh, a take and is willing to to change this status quo by uh, writing smart uh, algorithm and using this cryptography so i think that even though you might not have been uh, interested in writing encrypted emails in the past uh, for with bitcoin it's more and more obvious that this movement uh, will play a big role in the years to come yeah and that's why people should uh, should uh, should be interested in this topic i i forgot to to say the, the point where I, what i was making yeah i mean i think um bitcoin has interested a lot of uh, new people to some of the cypherpunk ideas, whether they identify them as those ideas or they just occur to them naturally as an observation, because while it's um, you know intriguing and empowering to be able to have an encrypted voice call or send encrypted messages at a distance, secure in the knowledge that nobody else, not even a government, can decrypt your messages you know, if you're using good software. Um, that is something that appeals maybe to a subset of people. Maybe some people don't care that much or, you know, they, they don't think about it. But when it comes to money, having uh, bearer money that you can send to anyone without a middleman is um, just a more inspiring and interesting use case. So where they might not worry about, you know, if somebody was reading their casual text messages or voice call with a relative somewhere else in the world. Um, the ability to send money globally where nobody can you know, interfere with that, like seize it, ask you why, prevent you from sending the money, um, is, is starting to make a lot of sense to a lot of people. So that's a kind of entry point. And then, so I think it's, it's interesting that people get involved with Bitcoin for, you know, through, through all kinds of different avenues, you know, casual avenues or as an investment or speculation, or to solve a particular problem, like they're trying to pay for something and their payment card's not working, or they're doing online gambling, like poker games and credit card companies weren't servicing that use case in some cases. So they, they have an entry point for lots of different ways, but once they think about it and talk to other people about it, it grows on them and becomes a very interesting idea that changes their views about other aspects or causes them to learn more about all kinds of things, you know, privacy, and how money works and things like that. So it's very interesting. Thank you. And um, I may say that it's fair uh, to assume that, uh, not assuming, it's a fact that Bitcoin is a driving force uh, behind making cybersecurity something, uh, let's call it general public, uh, becoming more interested because you need a certain level of knowledge uh, within the cybersecurity to uh, protect your bitcoins or crypt cryptocurrencies in general. But what do you think? How do you make security easier? What are your thoughts on the trade-off between encryption and user experience? Well, I, I think... Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Adam. Well, I was going to say that uh, I've, I've seen it before in other products that use encryption that it can be a problem that people forget the passwords or they make mistakes with backup. And you know, so people have used file encryption or disk encryption or email encryption have often some mistake story. They forgot the password. And if the encryption is good, there's nobody to reset the password because if it's, if it's properly secure, like end-to-end -end secure, as the saying is that only the people communicating can uh, access it, there's no service provider that can reset your password, then you know they will lose access to the data. 
and that that will you know that could be pretty uh, that could be costly you know maybe you have to retype a thesis there are people who have lost large amounts of data where it's been very costly in their time to reproduce it um, but if it's if it's savings and money it becomes more directly um, impactful and and in the same way there is there's no you know if you lose the keys if you lose the backup there's no solution. Now, of course, there are other other services around Bitcoin that try to, you know, make it easier to do, make it safer to do, and make it more reliable so that you know, the backup is more reliable or that you have redundant backups, you know, the uh, secret sharing. So you have three parts, and as long as you only lose one of them, you can still get the data back, things like that. So I think the Bitcoin is, um, so effectively doing usability research on necessarily very secure procedures and software and hardware packages that other systems have just lived with occasional data loss or data theft or data leaks. Yeah, yeah, these are very good points, Adam. Uh, actually, with Trezor, it wasn't like uh, we wanted to create a hardware wallet uh, in the beginning. Like we. We're trying to figure out how to make uh, Bitcoin uh, secure and usable at the same time, because you can come up with the most secure algorithm, but if it's hard to use, then people will often shove, shoot the, themselves uh, in in their feet, uh, either by losing uh, access to their keys or they will do something something stupid. And we we realized it is much easier to come up with a solution that combines uh, security and good usability if the solution is a separate uh, hardware and with Trezor we try to to package this uh, very advanced crypto algorithm in a way it's very easy for people to work with and it's hard to make mistakes and uh, with lots of things uh, it came up to us uh, uh, in, in, only in the retrospect that uh, we realized it's uh, suddenly it's much easier for people to imagine uh, Bitcoin uh, when they are holding uh, the treasure in their hands. So they are they have a really tangible feeling they are in control of their keys, while before while having. Uh, software wallet it was something really uh, untangible and very very virtual and of course we know that th the coins are not stored uh, in, in a hardware wallet but uh, this feeling that you have uh, your private keys uh, in your hands is really really empowering and enables people that are not uh, into cryptography finally understand what uh, this is about because it's it's been like forever that uh, that people are really good at hiding uh, physical things because we've been trained uh, for this for thousands of years but with hiding virtual things this is still brand uh, brand new so we were able to to shift this back to hiding physical things and like you mentioned there are uh, there is this possibility of having a physical backup being a single share or or multi-share, for example, uh, Shamir secret. And again, you are back to hiding uh, physical stuff, which is much more easier for, for people. Yeah, I think sort of, uh, you know, I think Trezor is relatively easy to use as an overall experience. I've seen some people without much technical experience gain confidence in using it. And that's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, it is fascinating, as you said, how people like a physical component, right? Because they can hold it in their hand, see all the uh, physical coins, which are just an analogy, of course. But having something physical and tangible is good. Of course, it's also good for security because, as we know, desktops are notorious for having malware. And you know, some of the phone OSs are better, but still not invulnerable. So having a single purpose piece of hardware makes it a much safer proposition as well. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank, and thank you, thank you, Adam, for, for such an endorsement. Um, 
very, 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 very pleased. Uh, and since you started, I would like to talk personal a bit. Uh, could you tell us about your pre-Bitcoin era backgrounds? Because both you, Adam and Pavel, have a rich background in cryptography and um, a lot of achievements of the pre-Bitcoin era. Um, how it led to what you do now? And how much does your previous work carry over to Bitcoin? If you'd like, you can start from the moment of identifying your first interest in cryptography. Uh, okay, should I go first? So, um, yeah, actually, when I was at college, which in the UK is uh, 16 to 18, I uh, had a go at writing in a, in a sort of self, like a program that you would put a password in, and then the password would decrypt and run the rest of the program. So kind of like a self-extracting executable but also with encryption. And of course, there are other, since then there are other systems like that. So like the uh, PKZIP packages, some of the other kind of archive and distribution packages have an encryption option. So you get something, you type a password into the software and then the software decompresses and installs or unpacks something. So I had a go right in there. I mean, of course, I forgot the details of the algorithm, but of course it was quite horrible, you know, probably something like the Caesar cipher and XOR and things like that. So it, it would have been, of course, you know, not very secure as a result, but I just thought it was an interesting thing to try. And um, it wasn't until university that I came across uh, public key cryptography. A friend of mine was doing a master's project involving making RSA encryption faster on uh, distributed computers, so a computer with lots of CPUs connected by a communication network. and because uh, it could be CPU intensive to try and make it faster by splitting up the work. Um, and then, so that, that was how I knew about RSA. And so some, probably a year or so after that, PGP came out. And of course, that was a very interesting thing in the flavor of what Pavel was talking about, which is the um, kind of social intersection of technology that the possibility for public key cryptography um, was a very interesting thing for changing the balance of power between an individual and establishment. And so initially the establishments didn't always like that, um, but it was very hard to stop on the open internet. And so that became common. Like at the time, um, you know, smartphones were maybe a bit locked down, harder to program, but nowadays, of course, many smartphone communication apps involve end-to-end -end secure encryption, like Signal and some of the other ones. So that's very cool. Um, so that, that was how I first became aware of encryption. And then I got involved with the Cypherpunks list because I was interested to find where other people were talking about this kind of intersection between technology and societal positive change. And that, that was where the action was. And of course they were talking about all other use cases like online privacy, anonymous free mailers, electronic cash. And so there were, you know, it's very exciting kind of vibe, sort of like Bitcoin today, but on a smaller scale, right? And so I spent a lot of my spare time reading about uh, different algorithms to achieve different effects, because while there are basic algorithms like, you know, encrypt a message, hash a message, sign a message, to actually get some of these effects is more difficult. You have to use some of those building blocks to assemble a protocol. And that is, you know, uh, a whole sort of line of applied research that continues for decades and decades because some of the things are hard to do. And one of the hard to do things was electronic cash. And so, you know, that kind of uh, continues onto Bitcoin. So. Maybe we'll switch to Pavel and we can talk about hash cash stuff later. Yeah, th thanks, Adam. Uh, I, I think that your your uh, history is much more interesting than mine. Uh, I'm uh, I'm relatively relatively young, and when when the cypherpunk mailing list started, or when PGP. Uh, program was developed in early 90s i was still like seven or eight years old so i had very very different interests back then and uh, later of course uh, when i was uh, in high school uh, it 
was my first uh, experience with the internet because back back then it was still not uh, very common to have a internet connection at home. So I started to to look into various uh, various groups on the Czech and Slovak internet. The the, the funny thing is that uh, even though the countries uh, the Czechoslovakia split into Czech Republic and Slovakia later the internet community is still still one how it was uh, even even when i was in in high school so i read a lot of a lot of magazines uh, that were written by the czech and slovak guys and i wasn't wasn't able to understand much back then but uh, it got me really dragged into this world and later when i was at the university uh my major was not uh, cryptography and i think at all but we were uh we were free to subscribe or to enroll into uh, any any subject taught by uh, the charles university and this was very very beneficial for me because even when i studied databases i sub uh, subscribed into some of uh, this cryptography subjects and uh, information protection subjects and it got me really interested and uh, it was not it was not a long uh, time after i finished university when uh, i discovered bitcoin and i was totally dragged into all the, this uh, cryptographical beauty so uh, as uh, as matve indicated in the beginning uh, i i didn't have uh, very much pre bitcoin uh, cryptography era when compared to to adam so i think your story is much more interesting in that regard that is very interesting uh that is very interesting and also um for the first time i i'm, I'm learning about probably your experience um pre bitcoin experience which is also interesting for me personally uh but to specify how did you first encounter with Bitcoin Go, and what is your story? I think Adam, it's 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 the right time to um, talk about Hashcash. <laughs> we cannot we cannot miss Hashcash. Yeah, yeah. So, right. I mean, how I came to hear about uh, Bitcoin was directly through Hashcash. So, Hashcash itself was a. I was running. Um, an anonymous remailer, which is a way to have privacy and freedom of association on the internet. And um, people would send spam through it, uh, we think, to annoy system administrators because they didn't like privacy. Um, and so I tried to think of a solution. And usually the solution for spam involves blacklisting, you know, IP addresses and email addresses and things like that. But because this is private by definition, you know, the sender is anonymous, you can't do that. And so I had to think about it in a different way. And so I hit upon this idea of using um, hash collisions to, to create a proof of work so that you could sort of incur a cost for the sender. So it didn't sort of transfer a value to the recipient, but you could incur a cost for the sender. And that was a solvable problem. So that's where the you know, hash cache stamp came from. And so I'd published, um, and I just published the source code and the description and, you know, people integrated it into remailers and used it for some other internet protocols. And it became somewhat famous amongst people who were interested in, you know, in their, in their day job or just for a technical interest in combating spam, because it was a very novel way to combat spam, which is to say, well, let's just make them pay. <laughs> Um, and will make them pay a cost, even though you know there's no no benefit. Uh, the reason being, it's it's easier and possible to do that than to charge people, and uh, you know, because payment technology isn't wasn't good enough to use PayPal or credit cards, and not everybody has them, and so on. So, um, so of course, there were other electronic cash systems. They seem to be centralized, and I think. Uh, ultimately, they failed, like the Digicash one, because they were centralized. So that that was the issue. You know, the the company that ran it uh, went bankrupt, and then the double spend database was lost. You know, 
the equipment was sold, presumably at auction or something. And so anybody who had coins would not be able to prove whether they were spent or not. So that was the end of the electronic cash system. So I think that caused a lot of people to, you know, on the cypherpunks list, to think about how could you uh, decentralize that. And so Hashcash was released for this anti-spam purpose, but coincidentally not very long after Digicash had shut down, arguably because of centralization factors. And so that caused, I think, many people to think about Hashcash as like something like digital gold and wonder about how to make that into, you know, how to incorporate that into an electronic cash system. But, you know, of course, today we all know how Bitcoin works, but at the time it was difficult to, to work out the details to how, the, how to make that work in practice. And, you know, there were designs that people heard about today, like B-Money and BitGold, but at the time um, there, were, there were sort of limitations in those that made them arguably not quite practical or implementable. So Bitcoin solved those. So how I first heard about Bitcoin itself was was relating to that kind of previous history, which goes back to sort of 97 and Hashcash was 97, but Gold and B-Money were 98, like ongoing discussion about how to make an electronic cash system and how Finney had built another, actually implemented something which was centralized but used Hashcash called RPAL in 2004. So in August 2008, I got an email from Satoshi just asking about citation for Hashcash and giving a link and abstract to his draft paper. And so I you know, read some of that and sent him information about B-Money because it seemed that he, did, he wasn't aware of B-Money and that Bitcoin was somewhat similar or related. And I think that's how he came to cite it. So that's, that's how I first heard about it. Bitcoin and I might have been the first person to hear about it uh, as far as I think that was the first email uh, as far as anybody kind of assembled afterwards and so you know there were there were more things that came afterwards you know posts by Satoshi himself on public forums and then the source code in 2009 and so forth but I think that was the first email um, that anybody got. How can how can you possibly beat a story like that? So it's very very hard to to compare. But uh, accidentally, I read about Hashcash in one of those uh, Czechoslovak internet magazines uh, I mentioned, because most of these articles were written by uh, by uh, elite hackers who were most uh, probably working for some internet service provider in the Czechoslovakia and they were combating a lot of spam I can assume so it was uh, kind of obvious they uh, sooner or later uh, found about hash cash and wrote about it but it took me like many many years to to figure out that uh, that uh, the Bitcoin's proof of work uh, was uh, inspired uh, by that and my first encounter with uh, Bitcoin was somewhere around uh, 2011, I guess, or maybe 2010, I'm not sure. There was a, one of the first Bitcoin conferences in Prague and uh, I, I was uh, invited uh, there because uh, every, every member of a uh, of local hackerspace in Prague called Bromlap was invited. Uh, and there I met uh, so many people and it got me really interested in Bitcoin. Soon after the conference, there uh, has been a series of uh, Bitcoin meetups in Prague. Uh, they were really small, maybe a handful of people. Uh, one of them was Slash, who was like a legend back then because uh, the Slash pool was already running, and I was uh, I was uh, I was mining on my GPU on Slash pool as well. So it was very very fascinating to meet a person like uh, like Slash who was behind this project and. Uh, of course, to realize he's not like a super, super secret uh, wizard, but he's he's a person like me. And 
uh, when it comes to this mining, what I said uh, on Slash Pool, I invested uh, all of my coins. I I mined there, of course, in a to, into a miner by Butterfly Labs. <laughs> so you probably know if you were back then that uh, that was a company that uh, it took uh, very long for them to deliver the Bitcoin miners more than more than a year. So that was a uh, a good lesson for me and then I learned that I should not spend my bitcoins on <laughs> buying more hardware to mine bitcoins and by that time I think it was like end of 2012 uh, uh, we started to meet with Slash uh, more and more and we were uh, trying to come up with the solution to the bitcoins uh, usability problem like I said earlier and we started to work uh, on Trezor. For me, it was a full-time job because I was uh, I was out of my earlier job completely. I wanted to focus on my own stuff and uh, Slash was sitting on, on two chairs and still maintaining uh, Slash pool. But now, uh, now, uh, now the Slash pool is uh, completely sold to brains and I'm really happy we can now spend uh, time on Trezor together. So yeah, that's 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 my story how I came to Bitcoin. Yeah, I also had some butterfly equipment. Uh, I did actually receive the butterfly jalapenos, but the I bought some more of the other models, and they arrived very very late. <laughs> but I was I wasn't completely deterred. I later bought uh, more miners you know, more recently, like uh, some inos and some uh, spondylis and some uh m30s more recently so it's kind of something um fun and interesting about mining kind of wonder if um it's part of the sort of economic cycle of bitcoin that you know there's a there's a group of economic actors that are enthusiastic maybe tending to want to keep as many coins as they can and they're part of the economic landscape so i think it's a know a richer more valuable ecosystem because there are miners involved and um, so I think coins that want to remove mining and go to proof of stake are probably making a mistake because I'm I'm assuming the part of the reason the Bitcoin's price bootstrapped was because of miners because they got those coins and then they had to ascribe a value to them and you know sell them to other people or collect them and want and, and get interested to collect them for some reason before they had an official market price so i think it's it's interesting doing mining and pools of course are part of that yeah yeah that's that's a really good uh, observation and uh, it, it never occurred to me that uh, that's that was one of the reason why uh, bitcoin bootstrap just beautifully back then yeah shout out to miners <laughs> Well, I mean, there's, there's a psychological theory that people ascribe value to things that consumed, you know, physical work or ingenuity. So, you know, if you ask them to buy something, you know, as a small object made out of wood or paper or cardboard or something, they would say it has low value. But if they actually participated in making it, and then they ascribe a more value to it, and so. So I was just thinking of the analogy with, with Bitcoin mining that I, I, you know, the original like GPU software was not so easy to use. So the people that managed to mine had to go on forums and trade tips with other technical users about how to even make it work or how to make it work better and set it up. And so it, you know, that uh, kind of camaraderie of uh, getting the thing to work and collecting the coins, you know, I think maybe helped with the with the bootstrap phenomena because after they expended that kind of social effort, joint social effort in figuring out how to use it, now it had this kind of psychological value to them, right? Which is they in some way built those coins <laughs> so they're they're valuable even if they had at no at the time no market price, right? They started with a collectible value, I think.
And since we've 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 touched the the, uh, the mining and uh, the uh, main components, the critical com cryptographic components, can you please elaborate a bit more uh, and take us through their uh, origins of some the, of some of those critical cryptographic components, just mining keys addresses. Uh, we already mentioned the hash cache and talked about it briefly, and uh, I would like to, I would like to uh, talk a bit more about about the other parts of it. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, there are a lot. There are different parts, but um, bitcoins are moved by making a signature, so there has to be a public key because uh, digital signatures involve public key cryptography. Um, but what Bitcoin technically does is uh, sort of use the hash of a public key and even more technically, actually a small, the hash of a small program, which has to return true. So you did be authorized to spend the coin and that's where the script language comes in. Though of course, most contracts are uh, whoever holds this, whoever can provide a signature with this key can spend a coin however they like. And so that's the most common program, but of course more elaborate programs are possible like lightning and different kinds of contracts. Um, so that's one part of it, the signatures. I think that's, you know, Bitcoin in a way doesn't use that much elaborate or esoteric complicated cryptography. You know, the signatures are widely used and conservative old technology. So that's good. You want conservative technology for security. Um, and, and we just discussed hashing there. So to, to make a, an address, it's a hash of the public key or the hash of a script. I think technically with Schnorr, the addresses become just the public key without the hash in some cases, a uh, small technical distinction. Um, and Hashcash itself is constructed using hashes only. So it's um, basically to find a collision, you are setting an, a task, which is to find a hash output that has a certain prefix and you can't steer the hash. It, it's, it's a bit like throwing, you know, a big handful of pennies, coins on a floor and seeing how many of them land heads and if you want you know 10 heads in a row you're going to have to throw that a lot of times before that will happen by chance and so it is with bitcoin mining so it's sort of doing a hash of the data which includes you know a summary hash of all the transactions that are about to get processed and the previous a reference to the previous block and some other data like the time and stuff like that and then a counter and it's just basically you this the you know the CPU, the GPU, or the ASIC miners are just trying a hash and look to see how many zeros at the beginning, and if it's not enough, they try again. And uh, so, of course, at this time, Bitcoin is trying a lot of hashes per second uh, globally across all the different equipment. And and there's also encryption that we talked about earlier, for, but that's more for that's more local. It's like not about communication. It's about storing your private keys securely. Thank you. And I would, a um, uh, quick, quick note for our listeners um, who join us a bit, a bit later after this starts. Uh, we will soon, quite soon, open up the discussion, uh, and I will. I see the list of of, of the requests, um, and I'll let you ask the questions to Adam and Pavel, and um, participate in the discussion. But I have some a, a bit some some more topics reserved, and I would like to deep dive into the technical details of of Bitcoin, and uh, in particular the digital signature algorithms. Um, the question is, as straight as it is, why did and Adam, I think uh, you will you will respond to this question uh, very precisely. Why did Satoshi choose ECDSA, uh, elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, and what is it? 
and why 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 was it the foundation um i mean I, you know partly people are speculating of course because uh, i don't know that Tashi ever explained why but it seems like a reasonable choice because um you want to use an algorithm which has been well tested and widely used and where there are libraries available that are secure and dependable and well reviewed and historically there were some other algorithms used for signatures like uh, rsa and dsa but more recently um elliptic curve algorithms became more popular because they are uh they have smaller messages and smaller keys um so they're more sort of space efficient communication efficient and have some sort of key size advantages like you can get more security from the same key size um and so ecdsa was the you know effectively the most widely used signature it's standardized by nist which is an american uh public institute for standards across all kinds of things but they also have a part deals with encryption and digital signatures so it was a nist standard and i think another reason so that's probably the most obvious reason now arguably schnorr signatures are slightly better and they're very similar but slightly more simple and flexible and the reason to not use schnorr signatures is that they were patented but actually the patent expired i think like the year before bitcoin was released or something but of course there weren't many there wasn't a standard for them because internet you know people when they're building internet protocols don't like to use patented algorithms and um so it wasn't you know standardized there was you no know, library support and so you know even though they're better it was just much easier i think for whoever was programming bitcoin to use ecdsa because it would be in the libraries and so on so it wasn't until much later that you know there was technical discussion about whether bitcoin could consider switching to schnorr or adding an option for schnorr so the first discussion for that kind of was in 2013 and it's you know now 2021 and uh, schnorr uh signature is probably is expected to activate uh middle of next month so we'll be then able to you know once software wallets have the capabilities we'll be able to opt to use schnorr signatures with the advantages they bring Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think you captured it nicely, Adam, but uh, I, I wanted to stress uh, what you said that uh, one of the main reasons why to use ECDSA and not uh, DSA, which was as common as ACDSA back then, was the size of the resulting signatures, because if ECDSA, these are much, much smaller and you really want to have signatures as small as possible because this is what you store in the blockchain forever and we want the blockchain to be as small as possible so everyone can participate in the full validation of the blocks and if if the signatures were 10 times bigger then this would not be would not be possible yep And can you tell us more about the sh um, about the Taproot upgrades, which we are all uh, waiting for in the very nearest future, and um, elaborate a bit more on how Bitcoin will benefit from uh, from the integration of the Schnorr signature? Oh. Just a couple more details. Yeah, so I mean the the soft fork uh, is uh, coming active next month uh, bundles a few related pieces of functionality so Schnorr signatures and taproot and master as well actually and so uh, taproot is is an additional optimization that I think Greg Maxwell proposed um, and became part of the standard as other people thought it's, it's an interesting and very useful idea it's a, a way to have a a public key, the the Schnorr public key, and to hide within it a an if statement, if you like. So 
when you see um, a Schnorr address, you can either, as, as a verifier, you can ex either expect the coin to be spent by signing with it, or alternatively, by revealing a commitment inside it, and then that will be a script, and then you have to satisfy that script. So that sort of is a hidden if branch. And so firstly, it's more compact because you ha don't have to show the if branch unless you, unless you need to use it. And secondly, it's a bit more private because um, you know, there, are, there are different types of wallets and use cases and the if statements, some of them have if statements, some of them don't, but for the ones that do, they're different. And you know, so you would be able to distinguish a multi-sig wallet with a time lock from a lightning channel from some other use cases. And with Taproot, you know, what, if, it, if it's adopted by those different types of wallets and use cases, then in the, in the normal case where you never use the if statement, it's actually not possible to tell it's there. So the public, you know, if you look at the public blockchain, you would only see just a signature. And so you wouldn't be able to tell if the transaction was a light, you know, was a lightning channel set up and close or just a payment from one person to another. And so that's a kind of additional form of privacy. So it reduces the fingerprinting of wallets and use cases, um, makes more things indistinguishable. Because if somebody was analyzing the blockchain, one thing they could do is they could categorize transactions and say, well, this subset are lightning channels. This subset is, you know, the green wallet with a time lock multi sig. This subset is maybe a Casa wallet, and so on, right? And this one might be a Trezor or another wallet that uses the same single sig method. So that fingerprinting is removed, and that's a, a positive step for privacy. And then MAST is a sort of generalization of the hidden if statement that you can have a whole tree of if statements that you can use for different uh, scenarios, sort of more complicated scripts. Thank you very much. That was that was thorough and explains it all. Maybe, Pablo, you have something to add to it? Uh, well, maybe uh, I can tell a few words about Taproot from a hardware wallet's perspective. Yes, please. Uh, in in the original design of Bitcoin transactions, uh, there was, in my opinion, a small oversight, and that uh, was the transaction fee is not explicitly part of the transaction itself, but it is possible to compute uh, the transaction fee if you just subtract the sum of outputs from the sum sum of the inputs of the transaction, but. Uh, Without the explicit field for fee uh, in place uh, for a hardware wallet, we need to stream all the transactions we are spending uh, so we can prove uh, the spent value. And uh, in order to compute the fee and to check whether it's not extremely large, whether there is no attacker trying to wrap us uh, via this more expensive fee. Uh, Segwit tried to fix that, but uh, unfortunately, the cryptographic commitment wasn't uh, strong enough to uh, to circumvent some more sophisticated uh, attacks. So we reverted the behavior of not streaming the previous spent transaction uh, into Trezor, even for Segwit, and this resulted in much worse uh, user experience. But the great thing about the taproot is there is uh, the new signing algorithm uh, provides much more cryptographic guarantee and we don't need to do it anymore because each of the inputs basically commits to to the fee even though the fee is still not explicitly mentioned the cryptographic commitment is uh, stronger so if uh, if uh, even even if uh, you are not using any sophisticated uh, taproot features, even this small change will improve uh, your life uh, very much if you use uh, hardware wallets. So I'm really excited 
for this uh, upgrade. And of course, there are lots of new options Adam mentioned uh, when it comes to anonymization and possible use cases we are still probably not aware of you can do with Taproot and Mast and other others other improvements. Right. I mean the, the Bitcoin script system is a kind of uh, stack programming language. And so the features of Taproot and Schnorr and Mast sort of add some more instructions to this language. And so, you know, the the full set of things you can do with it, as Pavel said, is is not immediately predictable, right? It depends on the future inventiveness of programmers and protocol designers to think of new things that become possible with this extra flexibility. So it'll be interesting to see what what people, you know, invent to make use of these new features or what new applications they're able to build. Thank you. Thank you. And um, as we are, as we continue the positive notes, you Adam mentioned before the positive so societal change a couple of times within the talk. Um, what do you hope will come from Bitcoin in the future? Well, it's a very vague question, I understand, but um, considering both technological investments and societal changes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, the full impact of Bitcoin has uh, not been felt yet. I think it's a very empowering and positive thing for the world. Um, because I think, I think it takes a while for the uh, impact of new technology shifts to take effect, you know, years basically as people, more people use it and are positively impacted by it and it empowers people. So, you know, even the internet itself had some effects of that in allowing more direct publishing. So this, the establishment lost their ability to censor information or influence news um and i think also you know the ability for people to to coordinate and communicate privately um you know it's it's considered that some social media and chat applications maybe had a, a factor and and you know just generally ability to communicate publicly about uh political topics it's probably a significant factor in the overthrow of some oppressive governments in the last decade, and of course the internet's been around for a long time, but you know the the landscape changes and that has impact over time. So I just think that uh, you know unsensible bearer money with some degree of privacy and a lot more user control, so there's no third parties that can you know prevent you transacting, seize your money, ask you questions about why you're transacting is. Uh, is game changing, um, you know, eventually of geopolitical importance. And so I think this concept of the sovereign individual comes into it, you know, that we'll get to a world with uh, smaller and less government and more self reliance and ability to, um, you know, to transact and store value without relying on third parties. and having government be a smaller part of the world would, would make the world better, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I definitely think uh, Bitcoin is one of the missing pieces of the puzzle we, we've we been waiting for, or we, we didn't know we were waiting for, but we now, uh, we now do. And like you said earlier, the internet liberated, for example, journalism, and for some time, uh, there was also uh, this, the the question of uh, incentivizing this journalist was solved because uh, it was possible to pay for articles uh, via the internet. 
but recently more and more we see that the credit card companies uh, are trying to to disrupt this uh, this flow of money in case you are not writing uh, some mainstream topic or you are not pleasing the government so i think it's it's a nice match to use bitcoin to make it uh, make it like it was or even even better that we can uh, incentivize all kinds of uh, things uh, that is possible with the internet without any without having any any middleman who says what can or what can't be done uh, using this great technology as as internet so i'm really really looking forward to the future and i hope the bitcoin will be adopted by more people and more companies and yeah i i'm really uh, motivated to work on making this possible and even better uh, it's it's a very interesting period of time for this technology to arise too because you know the original timing of bitcoin was around the sort of uh, 2008 global financial crash and then there's a genesis quote which is talking about quantitative easing so there's some kind of monetary policy commentary there i guess about hard money versus you know politically managed money but even since then it seems that the internet, which was originally you know, giving people more control and ability to self-publish has now sort of centralized in some ways in some big social media and platform companies that are uh, doing their own, you know, deplatforming people, deleting content that they don't like either based on their own management policies or based on government requests so some of the permissionlessness and innovation is being hampered on the internet and it's you know some aspects of it becoming a, a mechanism for control so i think you know obviously the ability to receive donations for a political cause are pretty important and that, that was something in in bitcoin's history also that when wikileaks got uh, deplatformed by I guess PayPal and MasterCard and so on, they were able to, I mean, they, they reactively switched to collecting Bitcoin donations and um, I guess became extremely well-funded over time because of the Bitcoin price appreciation since that time. But it's an interesting time for there to be an option to, you know, sort of self-fund for, because, because some people have, you know, they've, they've basically made a career or a job out of producing online content, but relying on middle sort of middleman platforms that then are prone to deplatform them for unpredictable reasons. And so, you know, the ability to replicate that with Bitcoin when they can't where they can't get deplatformed, you know, they can use a self-hosted wallet or, you know, they can, they can use their own wallet or that sorry, they can sort of host their own a merchant service like BTC Pay Server or just, you know, directly receive donations in a Bitcoin wallet, hardware or software it changes the uh, the formula so it goes back to the original kind of permissionless internet but now with electronic money and you know there people are also drawing lessons from the decentralization in bitcoin to see the problems with some of these centralized platforms that apply policies that obviously many or most of the users are uh, very displeased with to contemplate building decentralized you know, decentralized video, decentralized social media, centralized chat applications. So, you know, maybe the architecture of the internet is changing to follow Bitcoin. Uh, and this is this is all, you know, of course, for people to lose. I mean, as as banks become more and more controlling and intrusive and unreliable, people are forced to use Bitcoin, even if they didn't have any philosophical uh, interest to start with just to get their payment done right so you know i think uh, bitcoin adoption is actually being accelerated by you know increasingly quirky and inconvenient banking uh, experiences um, yeah thank you very very much those those all are very val so valuable 
points and I have really nothing to add to it. Um, I see a list of our listeners who would like to join the conversation and ask their questions. I will go one by one after my last question to you, to, to both Adam and Pavel. Can you tell us about your long-term plans in uh, Blockstream and in Satoshi Labs? And we will move on to, to, to the questions from the audience. Uh, do you want to go first, Pavel? Yeah, yeah, I can start. Uh, so uh, in Satoshi Labs, our company mission is uh, strengthening the power and independence of an individual. So that's what uh, we do and what we will continue doing. And when it comes to the Trezor Suite, uh, we are working on uh, full node integration. Uh, we are going to add a feature soon that will allow you to connect uh, Trezor Suite to Electrum server, because that was what most people have running on their full nodes. Then we are working on uh, Conjoin. Uh, we call it uh, privacy enhanced account for now, but it, be, it will be Conjoin like you, like you know it. And we, we made a really good uh, advancements in the user experience and i'm really really happy because i think we figure it out how to make a uh, conjoin very very easy for people to use uh, while preserving uh, very good uh, usability and when it comes to other efforts uh, we of course uh, have tropic square uh, which is working very hard on uh, bringing uh, the first fully auditable security chips we hired uh, around uh, 10 new people and uh, in the work is also progressing uh, very very nicely and of course there are some other projects uh, which are in our incubation phase, uh, we have our own lightning node. Uh, we are trying to grow a team of lightning specialists and we are also trying to uh, f figure out how to integrate lightning into our products. And I don't mean just the Trezor, but also other efforts such as uh, Inuity, uh, which is a third party uh, integrator company. Uh, which is uh, integrating uh, exchanges into our products. And yeah, I think we, it makes a lot of sense to look uh, into, into Lightning because that's, that will be very important uh, in, in Bitcoin's future. And all the use cases we were talking about earlier uh, with Adam, for example, this uh, micropayments for unlock, unlocking uh, the articles written by a freelance journalist. I think uh, this is uh, currently the way how to unlock the potential of this, these payments on the internet. So we are pretty much looking into that direction and uh, uh, experimenting in, in the technologies using in, in production and try to gather a new experience from using it. Yeah, so very interesting. Um, and I mean, at Blockstream, we're doing, you know, um, many different things, but the central theme is, uh, you know, helping Bitcoin get to the end, end conclusion, hyper Bitcoinization, widespread adoption of Bitcoin and Bitcoin improving over time or, you know, all, all of the things, uh, finality, privacy, fungibility. As an ease of use. Um, so we are involved in um, Lightning and in Liquid, uh, which is you know, another layer two for other kinds of transactions, confidential transactions. So some extra privacy, other assets, more uh, scripting, and so sort of more advanced smart contracting and mining and software wallets. More recently, our own kind of open hardware wallet. Um, the green the green wallet suite supports uh, Ledger as well, you know, and Trezor and you know Jade, so currently three and we're interested to support more. So it's a way to um, use the hardware wallet from a smartphone app. And um, yeah, so that you get the benefits of the hardware wallet security, but with a software wallet experience, I guess. 
And um, we also do mining. So we have, we do minor hosting, some mining for ourselves, and uh, our mining instrument in a token format, which is actually a security, so that people can uh, buy a kind of tradable, eventually tradable, like at the moment OTC tradable, but midterm exchange listed, and securities note, which is an interest in mining and a certain number of terahash. Um, and we have a lot of other things going on as well. I mean, the general theme is improving Bitcoin, putting Bitcoin into more people's hands. We also have the um, Bitcoin satellite network. So a set of satellites that we release bandwidth on the broadcast. All kinds of things about Bitcoin, real-time Bitcoin transactions, blocks as they're mined, um, the history. So you can sync a node over the satellite over a period of time. And uh, more recently we added um, lightning gossip data to, to make lightning uh, lower bandwidth if you have the satellite feed and actually also a programming interface so that you can send your own application messages over it. So that's a kind of summary of what Boxstream is up to. And for the future, you know, we, we're just going to do, you know, uh, bring in revenue and do more of those things and bring in more revenue, do more of those things. So just uh, accelerate uh activities we do we do quite a lot of uh work on bitcoin protocols and apply cryptography so we do quite a bit of the work on the libraries and protocols behind Schnorr signatures things like that so we're quite heavy in um sort of layer two protocols i would say and apply crypto around bitcoin I really like that you mentioned uh, the satellite project uh, because I'm I'm a big fan of it and uh, I I was thinking how can you make it e even better and you already answered that that you can stream uh, lightning gossip data through it so well great 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 well, I mean for the future we'd also like to get to a bidirectional service because this one is uh, receive only so you still need uh, you know, some low bandwidth to transact because messages are small. But there's a technical possibility with some of the satellite technology and different different equipment for the users to actually send Bitcoin transactions using the satellite as well. So we're you know hoping to get to that in the uh, in the future as well. Wow, that's super exciting to hear that there is a way how to make the communication bi-directional. So you, you say you might I might be able to turn off my SMS gateway with this. Uh, yeah, I mean I guess it's I mean, you know, in a sense more is better, right? So you know, you get more resiliency the more options there are. So I, I wouldn't turn it off, but it, it would mean that there is another you know, another way, which is available outside of GSM coverage zones even, right? That you could, you know, be on the top of a mountain where there's no cell signal for miles and still send a, send a Bitcoin transaction. So that'll be a pretty interesting uh, kind of way to sort of provide additional guarantees that Bitcoin transactions can be sent even in uh, you know, adverse circumstances, I guess. Yeah, g great to hear that. I'll be looking that space closely. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Adam and Pavel. Uh, it's it's honey to my ears what you were talking about for the whole for the, for the last ten minutes, and it, it's the future I'm very, very looking forward to personally. And I think it's it's just about time to open up our talk. Um, I want to thank you, Adam and Pavel, for this uh, for for this discussion. I enjoyed it very very much. It was super wholesome, super interesting. Um, just on a just a quick note um, to everyone who who joined us, um, please remember to join in the same time next week, same place for a look at the hardware security as we talk to Tropic Square uh we'll talk about chip design and manufacturing and uh behind the, behind the doors in the tropic square um and 
uh, we are proceeding to, to questions. I'm, I'm saying goodbye uh, and moving to shadow. So we'll be just moderating the Q&A session. Uh, my name is Matvey. I was your host today. Thank you very much for coming. First, uh, but it's not the end. Well, we're just proceeding to question. The first one in line is Rob Sultan. Hi, Rob. I'm adding you as a speaker, and uh, we will proceed with. Um, I will. I will add you as a speaker, and then as you uh, discuss, uh, either ask question or add your comments uh, and discuss it with Adam and Pavel. I will add the next speaker, and so on and so on. Thank you very much again. Uh, speak to you soon next week, and I'm giving a word to Rob. Hi, Rob. Hey, thanks for having me. It's been an awesome discussion. It's so crazy that this is free for everybody to listen to here. It's like it's just this Twitter spaces thing. I think I saw Jack in here. He actually still in here. Great job with everything, Jack. You've really done the community a big service. Um, I guess my question is, in order for the Bitcoin uh, you know, ecosystem to work and to continue to roll out, I would say it's past the point of no return, but to, to continue on that, more people need to be in cold storage. More people need to be taking it using these off ramps while they last hopefully they last for a long time these off ramps uh i i wonder to myself is it being like over complicated in the near term here because you can get a treasure i think by default you guys only do like a 12 word seed phrase by default but you go, it's better to have the 24 word obviously um i've heard horror stories where people just lose you know one passphrase and then suddenly they they can't have access to a multi-million dollar wallet and so it's like obviously this person has every intention to get their bitcoin back and is completely uh, in the right to do so, but can't get their Bitcoin back over a very simple flaw. And so if they could force it, if they could do anything to get their Bitcoin back, they can't. So it just what I'm wondering is I see so much complexity in the in the cold storage space that a newcomer coming in is going to go, oh, I don't know if I can do self-custody. This is very complex. I need to have multiple uh, air-gapped computers, and I need to generate my seed myself, and I need to do all these different things. How how much is it being overcomplicated, and would you like to see more people just getting the getting a, their feet wet, so to speak, and getting started instead of overcomplicating this this intense type of way to make their seed phrase. Because I guess uh, the, the final thing I would say on that is it was a kind of a mind-opening moment when I realized it's not about, you know, 21 million Bitcoin getting out of the ecosystem and all being in cold storage. If just 1 million Bitcoin get out, the fact that it's divisible to 100 million units of account into Satoshis, that's the Trojan horse here. So I just want to see at least a million, 2 million, 3 million units of Bitcoin getting out of the ecosystem. And I feel that people are overcomplicating this to, to make that happen. Well, if, if I may react to that, um, yeah, you're, you're right. Um, I, I think it boils down to, to education and we need to educate newcomers that are coming and joining our, our big community about what are what are the solutions and what are the drawbacks? And there is a certain group of people within the community that really tries to feel smart and they are overcomplicating stuff because they are capable to do it. But of course, for newcomer, this is this is a lot of noise and creating the impression that it's uh, it's very complex and that you have to have a separate computer with clean Linux install and su super complicated setups that combines three different hardware wallets. And I mean, this is probably uh, what you can do, but it's not something you should try uh, as, as your first uh, experience when you are when you are coming to Bitcoin and you, you should uh, get to know uh, what are what are the options. And uh, it's about about learning uh, learning the the drawbacks because uh, like we discussed uh, at the beginning of the discussion, when uh, a solution when a security solution com comes very hard to use, then you can either do uh, something stupid that you didn't want to do. For example, you send coins to 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 the place where they don't belong, or you lock out of your coins completely, either by uh, losing losing your your seat or something like like you mentioned. So I think 
we really need to try hard to explain uh, people what are the best practices and it's not it's not uh, it's not a rule that you need to always start with the most uh, secure and complex solution when you are joining the bitcoin community exactly it's um i guess when when i got on board to bitcoin and i liked how you brought this up earlier adam is you get your some skin in the game and then all of a sudden you have something to protect and then you go okay well what's the incentive to learn cold storage well do you have any bitcoin yet well once you do you have every incentive to protect this thing so when i got in and bought some bitcoins on an impulse buy you know a little while back then all of a sudden you have something to protect and so now i'm to the point where i'm building my own node and i'm doing all these things that i never expected myself to do but now i'm doing that because i want to protect my my at my asset now uh, so I guess the reason I want to bring that question up is because it's kind of a, like the real world question for a lot of people listening. It's like, don't, it's almost like I want to tell people to, to not overcomplicate it and just get started because the first thing I did was I actually, the first wallet I had was a Trezor uh, Model T. And then from there, I just went down the whole rabbit hole. I bought multiple cold cards. I, I learned the, the multi-sig situation and then I got my own node now. So it's like, I'm just constantly trying to learn more and more about self-custody because I come from the precious metal space. So I know what it's like to, to have to deal with, you know, storing your, your, your metal into a certain TL30 rank safe and make sure it's bolted to the floor, all these different things. So the idea that you can have this kind of level of custody for free and you don't have to pay a, a depository of 1% every year or something along those lines is absolutely like earth shattering. Uh, and so it was actually when we talked about the tangible uh, Pavel, I don't know if I, I hope I didn't pronounce your name wrong. Uh, when you brought that up earlier with the idea of basically um, more and more people being able to actually hold their Bitcoin in cold storage and it giving you that that tangible type feeling. Uh, that was the first thing for me that made me realize, oh, Peter Schiff is wrong. You can tangibly hold your own Bitcoin by having it in a cold storage. That That's very interesting. Uh, it's not literally tangible, but it makes it feel in that way when you have the real custody of it. So I guess I just want to bring up, uh, and Adam, I'd love to get your comments on this. Is is, it, is Are people overcomplicating this? Is a 24-word seed with a passphrase on top of that seed a very viable security? And then to start there and then kind of elaborate, build your own node and all that stuff after that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something to be said for, you know, not overcomplicating it initially because there is a different risk that if you do something too elaborate you might make a mistake you know um particularly if you if you uh are not yet that familiar with it and i think people are also surprised by how things can get forgotten over time like if you if you put some coins in cold storage and then you don't touch them for a few years you might forget you know some extra twist you put on top of it or the password you put on top of it or something like that right so there's two schools of thought about passwords one is you know don't put a password just store the key in a good place because you know um somebody might die in an accident and if they're the only person that knows the key uh, that knows the password then the coins are lost effectively right password is good so there's something to be said for that um and I think, you know, it's, uh, there is room to improve the usability. Um, you know, there may be some ways to sort of have a different way to access it if somebody fails at IT at, at their backup procedures, basically. So like with the green wallet, there is, um, there's a, a form of this, which is you can, it's, it's multi-sig, but all within one wallet. Right, so you've got one signature in the wallet. Another signature is coming from a server that is verifying two-factor authentication, like SMS or a Google Auth, something like that. And so there's two things you could lose. One is the the seed, and the other one is the two-factor authentication device, which is hopefully a different computer or like a mobile phone or a smartphone or a smartwatch or something like that. And people sometimes lose the two-factor authentication device. And what, what we did to protect against that is to um, basically have a time lock so that if you don't move the coins for, I think it's 90 days, then you can bypass it and you don't need it. And so if you're using it normally, uh, that timeout won't happen. But if you lose the two-factor authentication, of course, you can't transact. So 90 days will pass, and then you'll be able to get access to it without that. So the, that kind of time lock where the rules for access change over time if you're inactive 
could be extended to to other scenarios you know like if you don't exit for a year maybe the key owner is not alive anymore and you know somebody else should be able to move it and you could potentially set up more complicated rules but in you know there, there's scope to do that in a way that's still simple to use so that user can use it if they mess up there's a safety net that after a period of time there's another way to get their funds back so that you get more of the experience of you know you lock yourself out of your online banking there's a procedure to get the keys replaced right um and yet without introducing the possibility that the you know the, the security service provider could freeze your funds which is you know the opposite of what you want you don't want that so i think it's possible to thread a needle and do a bit of both basically um with some more work and try to make that usable i appreciate it i think that's really helpful to a lot of people listening i guess um I, that's a little bit further down the rabbit hole for me and I, i'm going to be digging into that a little bit more my, my current solution is I haven't seen any hack that can get into a cold storage without taking the actual physical device. So I like to have multiple devices. Um, whereas if if somehow some, one of my devices managed to get taken or the seed managed to get taken or something like that, or not the seed because th then they'd have the device. But if they there's there, I keep my passphrases in brain wallet. So I guess if I passed away, I would, my coins would go with me. But uh, having multiple devices gives you that ability to move your coins if one of your devices is compromised. Because uh, that's the only hack that I've seen is they have to get the actual physical device. Um, so, but that would take them like more than I think it's it, it takes days and days and days, if not weeks, to get to to laser take off the whatever it is with the physical device. So, multiple devices to move the the Bitcoin around if one of them does get compromised is, is an interesting uh, solution there for the near term. Uh, I I appreciate your your thoughts on it because it's like I just want to see more people getting their Bitcoin off the off the exchanges. Uh, because then you get leverage over the system instead of trusting the system. Uh, and I, I'd like to see more people get, because uh, I'm onboarding a lot of people from the precious metals industry. I've, I've brought a lot of people into Bitcoin that were very against it due to what, um, you know, Pavel, uh, what you brought up earlier, uh, you know, p having that tangible and teaching them, wait, no, you can actually have custody of this thing. You don't have to just trust an exchange. This isn't like your Apple stock. This is much different. And I think it's just been very much so overcomplicated. And I want to see more and more people um, getting leverage over these systems by taking it off the exchange. So appreciate all your comments on this and hearing your, your thoughts on it adds a lot of validity to the conversation. Hi. Um, hey, um, I had a question um, for, for Paolo or Trezor. Um, first of all, uh, thanks, thanks for hosting this. Um, I actually uh, own a, a Model T myself and um, other hardware wallets. But um, first, I want to just commend you guys on a really nice, slick UI with the Trezor Suite. I, I, I love the, the, the UI. And it's, it's very you know, easy to use. It's very clean cut. So I love that. But I do have a question in regards to, um, you know, people compare, obviously, different hardware wallets. And one of the biggest um, items or biggest factors that's always brought up is the notion of air gap. Right, um, like cold card, you know, this air gap is not um, connected. So, treasure, it is connected via USB, and then you connect that and talk to a uh, treasure suite. Um, but even so, what is the likelihood that even though it's connected, what is the likelihood that you know something can get access to the, the private keys that's on the model T? Thanks for the question. Uh, well, um, th th this is a, this is a complicated topic. O of course, we 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 designed the interface uh, of the messages that are being passed uh, on the USB in a way that it's uh, is not allowing to transfer any any private data, and uh, it's. Um, uh, when it when we look at the definition of the word air gapped, uh, it says that the in the, the device is air gapped if it's not connected to the live network. Of course, a lot of people think that air gapped must mean there is no cable involved, and that's why this question is being re returning again and again. And uh, like uh, Rob uh, earlier said, uh, there hasn't been any recorded uh, 
any recorded uh, case when the the secret was stolen from a hardware device uh, via uh, USB cable. Uh, it was always like a physical uh, physical access, or there was a software bug. And software bugs they can happen in uh, air gap devices uh, as well. Of course, you can maybe trigger a bug that uh, will write a private key into PSBT. That's that's totally normal. Even even if you are not storing PSBT on an SD card, if you are passing it uh, via QR code, it's the same situation. And uh, actually, there has been a buffer overflow exploit in the QR code uh, reader as well. So I'm I'm not saying there has been a complete hack using this, but you can you can totally uh, you can totally disrupt uh, even air gap devices uh, if there is if there is a if there is a software issue. Also, when it comes to SD cards, uh, this is even trickier because not a lot of people. Uh, uh, understand this but SD card is basically a really small computer uh, in a small form factor so theoretically you can come up with a uh, with, uh, with, with an SD card that has malicious circuit inside of it and uh, not only it could uh, destroy your hardware wallet but it might do some kind of uh, voltage glitching the same way you would do uh, voltage glitching over USB or something like that. Does that uh, answer your question or uh, would you like to uh, ask more about something I might have omitted? No, no, that was great. I just wanted to just get a sense of, you know, what, what, what is, um, you know, if there, if there is any sort of fear, but you know, no, you, you, you explained it really nice, Pavel. So thank, thank you very much. Really appreciate talking to you guys. Yeah, and also uh, I'd like to add uh, one small thing. Uh, I really like that there are air gapped wallets, uh, for example, uh, Seed Signer and others as well. And I like they are exploring that space, and I think they are pretty doing pretty good job there. So I don't really feel the need to go in the same direction, and we are trying to focus on bringing uh, security and usability hand on hand. And I think that fiddling with QR codes and SD cards is not as great usability. So uh, let me wrap up my thoughts. Uh, I, I'm not saying we are not going into that direction. I'm just saying we are not going into that direction right now because I think we still can do a lot of great stuff without uh, without uh, QR code scanning or uh, transferring uh, transactions via PSBT on SD cards. And of course, there are a lot of other players who are exploring this area already. So I really like that uh, Bitcoin also brings us this freedom. So every hardware wallet can explore different part of, uh, of, 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 of uh, possibility. And of course, if we will try together to make uh, the cake bigger for everyone by inviting more and more people into Bitcoin community, every of these uh, hardware wallet uh, producer will thrive. It's not, it's not a zero sum game. We don't have to fight with each other. Yeah, I think hey. for that. I'm gonna jump down. Yeah, I think some diversity is actually good. I think. Pavel was sort of hinting at that, which is that if people are using the advanced uh, multi-sig configurations, which previous commenter was talking about, it's useful to have different hardware wallets with different design trade-offs, because if it's in the unlikely event that one of them has a supply chain compromise or a bug, then if they're significantly different, you have a better chance that it doesn't transfer, like that the other hardware wallet doesn't have the same bug. And so you end up being protected if, you know, if two out of the three are secure, for example. Um, so diversity is good in that regard. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, there, there are some challenges with QR codes as well. Like if the data is too large, you have to go to animated QR codes, which may be a bit slower or less reliable or harder to use. Um, Blockstream Jade has a, a camera and screen with that possibility in mind, but the firmware is not, you know, we haven't implemented the feature at this point. That's, um, I guess, not, not so familiar with Seed Signer, but I guess that has a feature like that. But, um, you know, I think people should also look at the usability because, you know, apart from the security risks, there's, this, you know, losing the coins is, is a, a bad outcome regardless of whether they're stolen or somebody did something too complicated and failed at backup or misunderstood something about the backup instructions, right? So I think the usability is quite key as well for this use case. Hey, Adam and Pavel. Um, Pavel, I'm really excited that uh, Trezor is adding full node support to uh, Trezor Suite. I think that's uh, really cool to enable uh, trustless access. And I guess uh, in that vein, um, you know, one thing I've been looking at recently and I've actually started running was a LND node with Neutrino support. And I know that Neutrino can offer a lot of uh, advantages for wallets, allowing uh, trustless access to the network without running a full node. My question is, if we have a lot of these Neutrino clients running on the network, are you guys worried about, um, you know, how many full nodes there are to support it? And should we be bolstering full node uh, use as well? I think historically um, that there was an excess capacity of uh, SPV. Like, I guess there's it organically, historically organically, there's been enough nodes to support SPV or, I mean, Neutrino is a kind of uh, enhanced SPV to support the SPV clients in part, I guess, because uh, the SPV clients are you know, not as resource intensive. So one full node can support multiple. Um, so I would, I th at least as far as I understand, I think the balance is okay on that front. Towards that end, do you guys see your wallet app supporting Neutrino in the future as a way to access the network without having a backend at all or any kind of middleware? Yeah, we, we were we were looking into that direction uh, earlier, but uh, we we felt that we we will explore this possibility later, and we want to have this full node uh, experience via Electrum server first. But it's it's definitely a good point, so I, I will br bring it up again because we we were looking uh, into Neutrino, I think a year ago when. BIP 158 was discussed a lot, and we we hit we hit some we hit some blockers, but I can't recall right now what they were. So, but thank you for bringing that up again. Yeah, I think some of the hardware wallets. Oh, sorry, not hardware wallets, but some of the wallets in general, when they talk about full node, apparently they are like expecting to connect to an Electrum. Uh, interface, so a full node that supports Electron protocol for querying. But I guess that is, um, you know, the client footprint to be an Electron client is typically a bit heavy for a hardware wallet to run itself. So it has to be some kind of combination of software or browser and hardware wallet. But Electron protocol is interesting in principle because you could sort of interoperate, right? You could use a public Electrum server or you could operate, you know, you could run your own Electrum server and there are a few different Electrum server software packages or some of the Bitcoin full nodes you can buy pre-configured have Electrum support as well. I think many of them. Yeah, I guess the exciting thing there is that uh, potentially Neutrino could make the Electrum server kind of obsolete. But uh, cool to think about. Thanks for the answers. Yeah, I, I think I re remembered what the, the issue was, and the issue was that if you have a neutrino-like uh, uh, access uh, or feature, 
then it's very hard for you to show the full transaction history because then uh, the requirements are heavy again because you have to download uh, a lot of blocks while if you are using neutrino just for the lightning you are usually okay with only accessing the, the fresh fresh new blocks so we were discussing whether it, it would be possible to use neutrino in in a use case that uh, the trezor user interface would not show you the full transaction history just the just the latest balance and we kind of disliked that idea at the time but i think it might make sense to discuss it again so yeah that was that was the reason Do we have any other uh, people asking questions, Matvei? Yes, on the way, on the way. And um, Adam Pablo, uh, how much time do you have left? Um, Ten minutes are okay. What do you think? Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, super. Yeah, works for me. Hey, I just wanted to ask if you could address. Uh, you guys both have. Um, made the choice not to include a secure element in your hardware wallets and uh jade has done something interesting using multi-sig to give you that same well actually much higher physical security without having all of the downsides of the secure element and uh, i was kind of wondering if you guys could talk about the pros and cons of going that route yeah i mean i could speak about jade briefly so you know we we um we mostly built the hardware wallet um, to be able to iterate very quickly on new features and deploy uh, new, new protocol ideas. And so, for time to market reasons, we didn't do the do the uh, secure element. And also, you know, we didn't want to build another one the same. We wanted to build something slightly different, so there's some diversity. So. We took a decision to use an existing open platform, the ESP32 platform, which of course, I mean, it has some security features, but it's not a secure element as such, right? And so, yeah. you know, for that reason, we didn't have it. And then as you you, you seem to be aware, you know, that, that we try to find a way to sort of repair the security a bit by having a client server protocol where the, uh, seed that is stored in the hardware wallet is actually encrypted and the keys are sort of split so you have to succeed at passing sort of a pin challenge response protocol with a server and that gives you then the key locally and then you can decrypt and the advantage being that you have a sort of server enforced pin lockout, it gets the pin wrong three times and it's wiped. And then you have to go and get your seed out and reinstall it. And if so, and that doesn't change even if you, you know, have full access to the storage and you dismantle the device and bypass all its security mechanisms. So you get, you get saying a server reinforced approach. Um, but it does mean you need to have connectivity to reach a server, but most of the wallets want to talk to some kind of server anyway, because, you know, it's a, uh, you need to see the UTXO history and maybe a full node and things like that anyway. So it's probably not too much of an imposition. And um, yeah, it's it's a there's a open source implementation. It's standalone. People can run their own server. Actually, we released the source code so that you could run your own pin lockout server, so you wouldn't have to trust ours. And it's just it's a very simple protocol. You know, it's a, bit, it's a small piece of Python code. You could run it in a Raspberry Pi and hide it somewhere and configure your you know, your wallet to connect to it over Tor, and that could be an interesting kind of power user configuration. I, I do think the secure elements are interesting as well, but, you know, we, we did something different, and, um, you know, hopefully people can, other, other wallets might want to look at that uh, pin lockout server as a opt-in feature as well. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, and uh, Adam, uh, to be to be honest, uh, when we learned about your pin lock uh, idea, uh, we were discussing it a lot. And 
we, we were uh, we were pretty excited and <laughs> to, to, uh, and uh, uh, sorry sorry I I got lost uh, in my thought. Uh, what I wanted to say that uh, when we were talking about the the pinlock uh, idea you had, we were just so surprised how elegant it was, and uh, it was something that. Uh, was really really nice, and we were a little bit upset that we uh, didn't uh, came up with the idea sooner because it's like so obvious. So we are thinking about uh, doing it uh, for Trezor as well, and I'm not not sure how deep is uh, this in the roadmap. But uh, since you released also the source code of the server. I already felt that uh, you are willing to share the, the idea and the implementations, and that's what I have to really comment about your your approach and your company. So, yeah, thanks for this idea, and I think we will implement it uh, very soon because it, it's a, it's a really nice way how to how to synchronize the whole uh, mess uh, messy situation with uh, the secure elements, and we already talked about. Uh, Tropic Square earlier when we we realized the need of the fully auditable chip, which was not uh, simply on the market uh, earlier, and we didn't want to compromise our our vision by adding some new proprietary components. Yeah, so I, I, to, uh, I know that you've talked about the like Pavel specifically has talked a lot about the downsides of secure elements with. Um, the fact that, you know, maybe they make sense in an HSM, but if you have physical access to them and then you're giving up the ability to fully audit the code and really know what it's doing, doesn't this pin server thing give you the best of all possible worlds where, yeah, you're connected to the internet, but like Adam said, you're connected anyway. And, uh, and now you have something that's far more physical security resistant, right? If somebody gets it, it doesn't matter because it's secured by multi-sig, but you get all of the advantages of even generic hardware with none of the downsides. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's another building block. So I think it's additive. You know, you could have a secure element and a pin server. Um, secure elements are not fallible, uh, infallible. Like you know, it depends. And uh, some of the existing ones have had issues, you know, like API failures or overwriting. If you just you you can look them up. But basically, you know, they had to implement workarounds or over time upgrade to a later secure element. So the secure elements themselves don't have a perfect track record, but you know, for, for passive storage when they're powered off, it's it's pretty interesting, right? You you've got an extra uh line of defense. So I guess the pin lockout is trying to do something similar, which is the storage is encrypted at rest and the keys are not on the device and it's not just a password. Um but I think you should elaborate maybe Pavel about tropic your your secure because I mean basically you're building a secure element that's going to be open, right? I'm not sure that everybody picked up on what you were saying there. Yeah, yeah. We, we are we are right uh, at, the, at the beginning. Uh, like, like I said earlier, uh, we founded a company called uh, Tropic Square, which uh, has the ultimate goal to come up with the fully auditable security chip, and we uh, hired around ten. 10 people recently and we are uh, investing a lot of lot of time and effort into uh, into various our, our ideas we are looking into how to make uh, the chip uh, chip uh, secure from the physical perspective also how to make the algorithms that's that are running on the chips uh, uh, secure but i i don't really want to spoil uh, everything because the next uh, the next uh, episode of these uh, talks will be about uh, tropic square and i want to uh, leave some space for Elgin and honza to explain more about what they are doing but yeah in a nutshell we were investigating various secure elements in the past and uh, it just didn't meet our our standards so we decided not to use any of the shelf chips and we are investing uh, time and effort into coming up with our own chip which will be 
uh, audited by community and will be will be uh, available for review. I think we have we might have time to two more questions. Unfortunately, we can't be repeat at all, but we will have at least two spaces. And uh, as a suggestion, I can bring up. Uh, maybe you can go and if you if we didn't answer your question while this talk, uh, you can ask it in the comments to the announcement of this space on Shiva's DM, and uh, I'll make sure to uh, ask Pablo and Adam to get back if that works. Timothy, uh, Jose, do you want to ask your questions? You are other than speakers. Yeah, I can I can go ahead. Um, my question is not really specific with uh, technicals relating to mo modern encryption. Uh, it's more like uh, an opinion over um, how how the opinion on both Adam and Pavel uh, regarding the loss of keys. Um, I know that Satoshi Satoshi had and mentioned, uh, I think, one or a couple of times um, that uh, he, he, he thought that losing keys uh, actually brings more value to whoever hold the others. Uh, and I wanted to know um, at least Adam and Pavel thoughts on that, if possible. Well, that's, that's true, but it doesn't help you if you lose the keys, right? So uh, I guess it's, you know, philosophically, they kind of anti-dilute everybody else uh, as a small amount but yeah i mean i think ideally over time we wish you know i hope that people are able to find um sort of more robust uh key backup systems which can help people to recover their coins without you know having to trust a, a central party basically so there there may be some more options it's it's significantly about usability but also about finding ways to have security maybe with server or service provider assistance but only in the event that you lose the keys like if you don't lose the keys then you have you know you don't rely on them but if you lose the keys then after a time they can help you uh, i think that would be ideal uh, you know maybe a bit better um of course the challenge is how do they know who to give the new keys to or where to transfer the coins and so that is uh, probably an unsolved problem so far but maybe somebody can find a practical solution for it Yeah, like I indicated earlier today, uh, Taproot and uh, Merkleized abstract syntax trees uh, are probably opening new use cases we have uh, have or haven't thought about uh, yet. And I think we as a community will come up with some schemes that are sophisticated, but at the same time, very easy to use for for people. And Adam already mentioned that earlier with their green uh, green address wallet, there is a way uh, how, how basically the logic of the keys changes. So if you if you lose the key, there still might be a certain window where a certain provider might help you, even though you are still in full custody of your keys and vice versa if if a provider disappears then on, on after a certain time window you might be able to use the keys without the provider's cooperation but it's very very important in that regard to really distinguish between different setups and to understand whether you are still in a full custody or whether you are using some custodial wallet, which is of course much more easier to use. You can recover lost uh, password via email or something like that, but then, you know, that's not your coins there. 
if, if you are not in full custody. So I'm looking forward to improvements into that space. I think there is a lot of, lot of ways how to improve. Thank you, Jose, for the question. Thank you, Adam and Pavel, for this discussion. I'm very sad to um, to end this, but we've been here for two hours already, and uh, we have two more spaces within the Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Next month, I will just repeat, next next week it will be with Tropic Square, as Pavel mentioned, about the secure element, chip design and manufacturing, and uh, Wednesday after the next Wednesday, uh, with James and Lop, we will discuss the uh, safety and security in Bitcoin and how to stay away from phishing and scams. Thank you very, very much, Adam, for, for joining us. Thank you, Pavel, for, for joining us and for creating Satoshi Labs. Um, thank you very much for attention to all our listeners. It's been a great talk. I really enjoyed it and looking forward to see you all next week. Stay tuned for, for more updates on, on our Twitter uh and reserve your questions ask them in, in comments and dms anywhere we'll make sure to 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 respond to them thank you very much again and uh, have a great day evening morning night stay safe bye bye thanks bye thank you thank you very much uh, for this talk and adam for joining us it was a really nice pleasure to connect with you at least uh, like this in these virtual times. Thank you and I'm looking forward for the next uh, week.